Hey Wargamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough, and I have kind of a different video for you today, and that is how do we give the best demos of Age of Sigmar 3.0? Now, some of you will remember, I've mentioned it in a few uh, live streams a couple weeks back. Um, my buddy Steve was like, hey, can you show me how to play Age of Sigmar? And it was a very, uh, it was a disastrous demo. Like, we were playing with different points levels. He had second edition points, I had third. I made a lot of assumptions uh, about how into the game he was. And, and you know, in terms of like the, uh, the drip feed of new information about the third edition that we were getting. And it just kind of ended up being a mess. We still had a great time just hanging out. But as far as actually demonstrating a game, it was a disaster. And after that happened, I went over to the community tab here on my channel and I just asked, what's the biggest blunder that you have done when you have given a demonstration of a game? Could be any game. Doesn't have to be Age of Sigmar, just in general. And the answers were, I mean, about the stuff that you would expect. A lot of assumptions about how much the person you're giving the demo to knows, uh, about being too aggressive, about trying to explain too much, about explaining too little, and all these things like that. And so what I did was I then took all of those answers and I was like, okay, how can we make a process uh, that kind of addresses the majority of these? And so to that end, I put together sort of like, how do I build the perfect demo, right? And so I, I cooked this whole process up in my mind. And luckily, uh, this past weekend, I had a chance to try it out. Uh, another gentleman named Jeremy locally uh, wanted a demonstration of AOS 3.0. He, he plays other things like Lord of the Rings uh, and like Underworlds, Warcry, that kind of stuff. But he wanted to see what the full AOS experience was like and asked me for a demo. And so I took all that knowledge and the things that I had kind of put together and wanted to try out into practice and was able to create uh, an excellent demo for Age of Sigmar. Uh, he said, I did great. <laughs> um, he's, he's in the game now. Uh, he's into it. He's going to start Path of Glory here with us pretty soon. And I'm very excited about that. So what I wanted to do was show you what I learned uh, and kind of what I came up with for a demo strategy. Um, it's not like a, a one size fits all thing. Everybody learns and teaches differently. So just kind of keep that in mind. I just want to show you that, um, first of all, I bombed first, but then secondly, you can fix these things. You can improve them. And I wanted to share with you what I learned. You can agree or disagree. Leave them in the comments down below. That's totally fine. This worked for me and it worked for the person I gave the demo to. And I hope that it works for you too. So without further ado, we're going to go to a uh, slideshow presentation, which is something that I don't often do on this channel, but it helps keeps my thoughts organized. Um, and I'm not just going to read the slides to you. I do have other things to add to it verbally. So stay tuned. You know, just kind of put your headphones on and chill out. We'll walk through this together. So here we are at the slideshow hosting AOS 3.0 demos that stick. A guide by someone who failed and then figured it out. And that's all I offer in terms of wisdom. So we start off with what actually matters. When you're giving a demonstration of a game, you're, you're not trying to show them every single facet of design space that the game manufacturers or designers have come up with. What we're trying to do is get people to walk away with three basic things. There's the rules, which is, you know, they have to learn how to like actually play the game. They have to know what it's about. Uh, the social aspect, because remember, when you're giving a demonstration of a game, you are inviting them to a community. If it's at a convention and you'll never see that person again, you're still inviting them to the games community. And obviously if you're giving a demo at a local store, you're inviting them to your personal community. So there is a very heavy social aspect to every single one of these. Even if it's a game that you wouldn't normally do on game nights, if you're demoing a game, that person then has to be able to take the game and then have a social aspect with whomever they're playing with. So kind of keep that in mind. And the last thing is the experience. You want things to be remembered. You want this moment to stand out as like, I had a great time playing AOS or learning how to play AOS. And so I think those three things are absolutely key. Um, what you leave out in terms of rules, and we'll cover that, is just as important as what you include. I'm going to put that up top because I do think that these three things are what I decided I wanted people that I give demos to to walk away with. They're going to walk away understanding the basic concepts of the game so that they can go online and look at different war scrolls and all these kinds of stuff and have some context for the rules that they're reading. Also, 
I want them to have like a good social, you know, I mean, this game specifically with demos is so important in the social aspect because you're spending two and a half hours with someone. So make it enjoyable. And then uh, lastly, that I want them to have fun and, and fun memories and act like they, even if they don't get, end up playing Age of Sigmar, they didn't waste their time, right? They had a good, good afternoon. Now, right up top, um, I want to kind of address those in order. So like, you know, rules mechanically, how does the demonstration go smoothly? And then we'll talk about the other two aspects, the social and the experience afterwards. But kicking off with the uh, rules section, let's talk about the kind of list that you should bring. Um, first of all, first and foremost, cool models are like a lure to get people in. No one has ever like seen, I don't know, Privateer Press half-built models on a gray base, nothing's primed even, you know, no no one has arms because they don't want to commit to a, uh, a different type of unit and been like, oh wow, I want to play that. But if someone walks into a game store with no idea what miniature games are or this entire industry and they see, I mean, even just standard painted armies, you know, three color minimum, that kind of stuff, they look terrific. Like honestly... Games Workshop does a lot of the work for you by making models that look incredible and dynamic and beautiful. Put that on display for people. Um, I, as a basic rule, everything should be painted. You know, I mean, again, to a minimum standard, you don't have to go crazy. Just have something that you can show people. This is a part of the hobby as well. Now, my tip here is that the two forces should highlight different elements of the game and expose players to what it has to offer. When I say that, what I mean is, uh, I'm going to go through my lists here uh, in just a moment, but having different units that fill different roles. You can have an artillery piece that's all about shooting. They say the Celestar Ballista, have a hero. I, I would strongly suggest having a monster so you can at least discuss how the different wound charts work. Um, wizards, you know, those kinds of things where there's just different kinds of units available so they're being exposed to all different mechanics. It's not about a balanced game, it's about demonstrating how the system works. Now, for my overall thoughts, I'm going to get to my uh, specific examples after this, but really we want to educate people. If we're talking lists and the kind of game that we're running, we want people to have exposure to different aspects of the game. For me, um, I chose to create two lists for the 600 point level of the game, and I do that for a very specific reason. Uh, the reason I did that is because, one, it's it's just a handful of units. Um, I think in my game, one side had four units max, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, as far as the other point of doing 600 points is that is the smallest size you can do for Path to Glory. So if you go out there and you hook somebody, you can be like, yeah, doesn't this seem manageable if you played it like you know two or three more times? You could totally understand all the rules for a 600 point game, and we can do that. Like we can do that as a league, we can do it as a game group, whatever. And then you can incentivize them to grow from there. But 600 points is so manageable that it's a perfect target to shoot for. And as I said before, all different kinds of units, he, uh, heroes, squads, because you're going to teach them coherency, wizards, monsters, with the different health brackets and stuff like that. Now, one of the things that makes this a bit harder, you know, if you as the person giving the demo have kind of a, a hawk eye on the different war scrolls that you're bringing. For me, simplicity is the best. Uh, one thing that I can say, um, I use the Dominion side of the Stormcast for my demo. And I gotta say, all those War Scrolls are super simple. It is really nice to see like Vindictors have just a nice blank <laughs> War Scroll basically, except for their, you know, to hit attack. And even then I only had to remind my, my opponent like two or three times and then he got the gist of it. So the less text, the better. You want them to focus on, you know, basically training to look at the stat lines and then look for rules when they're applicable, but not overwhelm people. I do suggest, at least in my game, we did not use any allegiance abilities. So the Stormcast player could not deep strike in. Um, and I, as the, uh, I was playing Slaves to Darkness at the time, couldn't use any of my abilities. There's nothing like that. We'll get to more of like the rules we leave out here in a moment. But the reason I think that's important is because it keeps things moving and simple and you're both on the same page. 
So I wanted to show off here my two lists. This is my Slaves to Darkness army. As you can see, no grand strategy, no triumphs, nothing like that. I have a Chaos Sorcerer Lord on a Mana Core because I want to demonstrate um, obviously magic and monsters with wound brackets. I wanted to demonstrate large units, so 10 man units of Chaos Warriors and one Fulmeroid Crusher. This gives me the ability to show off, you know, the monster abilities, uh, but also do so in a way that is different from each other. One has a health bracket, one does not. And for the Stormcast Eternals, uh, I just pulled stuff that I had straight out of the Dominion set. That is the Knight Arcanum. Again, it's a wizard. The Lord Imperitant, which is a hero. Uh, he has a gun, which is kind of awesome. Uh, and two units of Vindictor. So again, two small units because the coherency is different between the five-man units and the ten-man unit of Chaos Warriors. So we're exposing people to all these different kinds of rules and, and how units can look differently from one another. Now, moving on to a, a sort of slightly debated topic is what we leave out. Now, most folks will not argue that learning all of Age of Sigmar's rules at once is a daunting task. It really is. So I think most people agree we can leave some things out. And I wanted to share with you what I chose to leave out. So the basic idea here is keep it simple, stupid. We're trying to cut down on you know, mental clutter or analysis paralysis, whatever things you want to call it, we want things to be as simple as possible, right? Focus on specific war scrolls and actions and that kind of stuff. So uh, basically the way I wrote this out was no battle tomes. You can explain as the game goes on what battle tomes offer, um, but without understanding the core mechanics of the game, like you are demonstrating, none of those things make sense in context. So it, it's really, ex you know, if you don't explain charges and that kind of stuff, well, the storm strike ability to come down only makes so much sense because it just seems like your guys can't get anywhere. They come down from the sky and they won't be able to charge in their minds because they haven't learned about charging yet. They need context for understanding what is in the battle tome. So I would say, you know, you can point to the book. It's full of cool art and lore and uh, extra rules for you uh, that really make this army flavorful. But don't worry about that quite yet. The next one, I think most folks agree, no battle tactics or grand strategy. So you're not choosing something every single round. Um, grand strategies, it's a fantastic one for when you reach kind of that next level. Like, you know, if they buy in and they start playing regularly, introduce it slowly. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, listen, um, we're playing the, the most basic core rules, but there's a few other things on top of that that I think you would really like, right? There's no one's going to feel like you're um, being condescending to them for like <laughs> trying not to overload them. And lastly, this is the one where some people disagree, but I decided not to use any artifacts or spells that were not on the war scroll. So you have wizards, you have um, mystic shield, arcane bolt, and whatever is on their war scroll. But beyond that, nothing else. Again, I believe it's because a lot of the mechanics for artifacts and spells and command abilities require context to understand their usefulness. And so, you know, let's just put that out of the way now. Stick to magic missiles and, and buffing up saves and that kind of stuff. Again, keep it simple. What I do leave in, however, are things like heroic actions, uh, monstrous rampages, those kinds of things that, like, let the models that you see do cool things. Because, again, we're trying to get an experience here. So I do keep those. I keep the, um, the list of all the abilities that everyone has access to out. Uh, we'll talk about that when it comes to the social aspect of it. But in truth, yeah, trying to cut out as many round-to-round -round things as possible is a great idea. So you have your two forces. Again, you don't have to use the, the forces that I came up with. Just I try to have a mix of different kinds of units, and I, I would say around the 600-point range. But now you have to do something with them. Now, the tried-and-true method is just to run at each other and punch each other in the face. But to be honest, I don't think that does a good job of explaining how this game functions to people. Because again, everything's about contextualizing what they see about this hobby. So if you just run and punch each other in the face and all of a sudden they're like, okay, okay, that makes sense. And then they see, you know, monstrous characters like Archeon and all these things that are just like murder machines. And they think that a whole point of the game is just to murder stuff. Well, they could be like, well, this is, you know, pay to win that kind of thing and get disenchanted with it. 
But battle plans make up the basic structure of every single game. So I think leaving them out of a demo is a bit of a disservice. Because again, some units are very weak, but if it can teleport and capture an objective, it's incredibly good. <laughs> so again, trying to get them to understand how this game functions. There's different strengths for units. They can do different things to contribute to victory in very different ways. It's not just killing the enemy. So I don't really have like a specific one here. Um, I just want you to have some form of mission, some end point round wise, and then, you know, come up with whatever sounds cool. So I have a few examples here. King of the Hill, just one point in the center. Whoever controls it at the end wins. Super simple. Uh, you can do like they have here in this battle plan where there's two different points. Player A, player B, you know, you get two points for your capturing your opponents, one point for holding on to yours. That way you can teach them scoring every round if you think that they can handle that. Uh, you could also do a more thematic mission where you're just, you know, assassinate the opponent, opponent general by round four or something like that. It doesn't really matter, but having units move to fulfill a certain purpose is I think a very, very important thing. No one's asking you to redesign the GHB with, you know, the most intricate and, ma you know, masterly written battle plans ever. Just have something where there's an objective other than smashing face. For my game, what we did was we put a, a objective to the left and to the right, rather than uh, the center of each deployment side, and basically said, hey, if you have more guys than me, um, and we did go through how objective capping works with monsters and things like that. You know, if you have, if you capture the objective, you get a point, and then we'll just count up the points at the end. That's all we did, kept it simple. Now the next point to, to harp on here is printing things out. Um, I didn't want to approach this demo like I did my last one where I was kind of scrambling at the end. I was like, no, 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 I'm gonna print all these things out and I'm gonna have it ready to go. So what that means is I printed out the quick start rules. I printed out the war scroll pages from every single unit that I took uh, for, you know, and this is an important thing to, to note for folks. If you don't know, nobody coming into this hobby would know this. If you go to the product page for any unit, in Age of Sigmar, or can be used in Age of Sigmar in the case of like Underworld's Warbands or Warcry. If you scroll down, you'll see a tab that says Downloads. You can get their war scroll in a PDF. Print it black and white, there you go. You got everything you need. So if you come prepared with really easy to access resources for people to see their rules clearly, it is a huge help. You don't necessarily need to do that for the battle plan, just because you can explain that one. Again, if you're keeping it as simple as I'm thinking, you can just explain that as you go, but this is the kind of thing where putting that in a player's hand and letting them like look at what the units do in context next to one another is invaluable. And so that's pretty much it for the, the rules portion as far as like the mechanics of how this game is going. You have two forces, you got a battle plan, and you're going to be explaining it as you go. Let's talk about the social aspect of the game. Remember, if you are giving a demonstration at a local store, you are inviting this person to be a part of your game group. Okay, this is like a handshake. So the tip here I put is uh, you cannot control if someone likes the game, but you can control how it's presented. If you look sharp and you have all your materials prepared, you're excited and engaged and you're ready to teach, that looks amazing when it comes to the social aspect of this game. Now onto our next slide here, I called it communication tips. I'm not, I'm not teaching, telling you how to act, okay? I can't emphasize that enough. What I mean by communication tips is how do we bring that person more into the game, right? How do we communicate rules? How do we communicate experiences and get them used to how this game functions when it comes to referencing rules and that kind of stuff? And the, the core thing I put here is they aren't just a player, they're a person. And by that I mean... Watch your tone, be friendly and inviting, ask questions, you know, just kind of keep a beat on, on how they seem to be enjoying themselves. I'm not going to tell you how to act beyond that. But the points that I have here uh, are things that I do see a lot of people not doing when it comes to demos. When I was at Nova in 2019, I took demos for like eight different games. And I will definitely tell you, uh, people fail at these a lot. So the first one here I think is the most important, and that is think out loud clearly. Okay. What I mean by that is you're given this demo. You got your forces, you got your battle plan. 
uh, let's say you go first, right? You want, you basically were like, hey, let me go first. I'll show you what a, what a turn looks like and then you can go. As you are taking your turn, think out loud. Okay, hero phase starts. Uh, I need to see if I have any spells I want to use. Nope, no spells for me. Um, I want to see if I have a heroic action that I want to do. Okay, uh, I'll roll for the command point one. Okay, didn't get it, never do. That's all right, it only hurts when I think about it. We're going to move into my movement phase and then move this guy. Let me see his war scroll. It's five inch movement, so I'm going to roll a die. Okay, now it's a run. Okay, now we're on 11 inches. That kind of stuff where you're thinking through the, the logic of your decision making out loud for them. This is the same thing when you're playing like skirmish games, when you state your intent of like, hey, this guy is supposed to be around this corner, not visible by anybody. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, cool. Like we've, we've established communication. We've established uh, how we're going about this. One thing that I don't see enough of is people asking the, the person receiving the demo to look up rules and stats. And this can be very simple. I don't mean to say like, read me your war scroll all the time. What I mean is, uh, you know, I might know all the stats on those Stormcast models, but when I was playing the Slaves of Darkness army, I'd be like, oh, does your guy have, what's, what's his save again? And just kind of like, you don't have to feign ignorance, but just get them into the practice of referencing their rules and where to find information on the war scroll. What's those guys movement? Uh, what's the range of that weapon? You know, you can just ask questions randomly. You know, again, it's it's part of your thinking process. Say it out loud, get the information. But the point is to start, you know, training new folks to look for information. And the last one here is to let them drive. Now, I am somebody, um, I, I teach the same way that I learn. By that, I mean, I'm somebody who I have to see it done and then walk through it with somebody watching me and then I like to do it on my own. So I do the same thing. In our demo, I took the first turn, thought, you know, I was pulling an edge here and thinking out loud, went through my turn. When I passed over my opponent, I would say, okay, it's the hero phase. So heroic actions, spells, command abilities. And then I would let them decide what to do. I'm there if they have questions. Maybe if like a full minute goes by and they're just staring at the table, I can offer, you know, something, you know, and, and just keep it brief. like. May I offer a suggestion? But that's it. Um, for the most part, you want the person receiving the demo to feel like they played the game. Because nobody wants to show up and just like watch someone play, you know, a one player game and just sit there and stare at the table. It's like, no, you want them rolling dice, you want them moving models, referencing war scrolls, and having fun. My tip here at the end is just everyone learns differently, offer guidance at the beginning, but only chime in when you're asked to. So walk through things and then offer it if they seem to be stalling. I kind of got ahead of myself here with the uh, slideshows, but I put an example here. Um, take the first turn, walk through each of your phases exactly and say what you're doing. And then when it's their turn, it's the hero phase. Which heroic action do you want to use? Now they look at the list of heroic actions and choose one. It's the shooting phase. Do you have any ranged attacks? Again, they look at their war scrolls to see who has a ranged attack. Uh, funny enough, the Lord Imperitant has like a Roman candlestick firecracker staff thing that he shoots out of, which doesn't make any sense, but I love it. And that's uh, one of those things that you wouldn't see by looking at the model, but if you get them to look through their different war scrolls, they will notice it. Now for the age old question, do you let the person receiving the demo win? For me, I generally say yes. Again, it's it leaves that positive experience of like, this is a learnable thing, it's doable, I can be good at this. That being said, dice games will be dice games and sometimes dice games don't like new people. <laughs> um, I had a demo, um, probably one of the best demos I ever received was actually for War Machine and Hordes from a local guy named Steve, um, who's actually the Steve that I'm playing against now in Path of Glory since I've moved back. And uh, with our game, the dice were just not going my way. And it was very clear there was just no way for me, the person receiving the demo, to win. Okay. Um, what I would say at that point is, you know, if things go sideways, you can always pause the game to chat about the outcome. You can 
don't crush them into the ground, you know, club and baby seals, but just say, hey, listen, you know, uh, this game's gone a little sideways, your dice are failing you, but that's how the game plays. Do you have any questions about it? And then, you know, don't let them feel the crushing sting of defeat, but instead you can pump the brakes and say, let's just talk about what we learned. What do you like about this game? There's this idea that every single game, even a demo, needs to be played to its utter conclusion. You stomp and you you crown up all the points that you accrued and that kind of stuff, and it simply isn't true. You're giving them a taster for what this experience is like. If that experience begins to sour, meaning, you know, because of dice rolls specifically, it was just not redeemable on their end, uh, man, you know, just pause it. And that's okay. For me, uh, somebody... When I had that experience um, learning War Machine and Hordes and it became very clear that there was no way for me to win, I remember Steve asking like, hey, do you want to just, you know, do you want to play this out or do you just want to chat about the different factions or what we could have done? And um, I said, no, actually, I want to play it out because I want to get as many reps with these interactions in as possible. So don't assume that they want to stop playing, but just make it very clear like, I can see this is going a weird way and uh, maybe maybe you want to pause here so we can chat about the game rather than just crushing you. And the last point that I wanted to do is creating an experience. This was the third thing on our, our initial list of, of what to do during a demo. Um, and I put this line here because it's absolutely true. Nothing will sell this game more than an emotional connection. That is true for every single thing out there in the world. When anybody rolls a hot dice, whether it's a save or an attack, you celebrate every dice roll. These are supposed to be epic clashes of armies and you can just get in there and just laugh and, I don't know, role play if you think it's appropriate and it wouldn't weird them out. Do whatever you want, but celebrate all of the cool moves. And on that note, compliment smart moves, smart tactics. Um, think out loud about how it hinders you. So, if, for example, uh, if a opponent moved a unit of vindictors up to guard an objective, I'd be like, oh man, that's going to be hard for me to, to get around. That's a good idea. You know, if they specifically put them in a good way that blocks them. So just kind of think about what your opponent is doing, who you're giving the demo to, and, and just look for ways to compliment. Oh, yeah, you, you seem to have a grasp on this. You're really getting it. And the last one here is to thank them for their time. Whether somebody has any interest in this game after your demo, thank them for their time. Because like I said before, you can't control if someone likes it but you can control how they are exposed to it. That maybe on down the road, somebody will hear more about Games Workshop stuff. Maybe they'll hear about Underworlds and think, I know Games Workshop stuff. I had a great demo with AOS. I'll try Underworlds. It's much more my style. It might not help your group, but it helps somebody. It gives them a good experience. They haven't wasted that time. Someone appreciated their presence and was actively engaged in a fun game with them. That's wonderful. And my last slide here is that post-game chats are important. So I want to just go out and say, like, let's say a store gives you a certain amount of time to run demos, right? Let's say they give you two hours. Do not let your games go to two hours. Let them go to an hour and 15 max. Because this post-game conversation that you have is of vital significance. Talk about key moments in the game. You know, again, re-complimenting them on smart moves and plays and, and pivotal moments, whether they won or lost, you know, because of the way dice rolls go, uh, just kind of signify like, hey, you know, man, I couldn't believe it when I rolled that many saves against your attacks. You you did the right thing in attacking them, but my goodness, I rolled hot out of nowhere. Like that kind of stuff. It's fun. It's what we talk about when we have games at tournaments and cool stuff like that. Bring them into that environment. One thing you can also do at this point is is start including stuff that has to do with um, allegiance abilities. I put that there as a tip, like this is the time to explain other aspects of the game. So like battle tomes, spell lores, um, how allegiance abilities can affect things. So like after our game, uh, I was talking about how, oh yeah, and Stormcast have this cool thing where they can teleport into the board and hey, that Lord Imperitant you got in your hand, uh, he can make them come a little closer and, and probably get a charge off even better. But you can understand why without the context of how deployment works or charging works or anything like that, they don't have context to understand what those rules are, but now they do. So you can explain it to them and get them excited about it. Now the next two are kind of in tandem here. Um, Is there any faction that they like aesthetically? Meaning, you know, typically there's a wall of product. Just point them to some stuff and be like, what looks cool? What's the first thing that grabs your eye? 
And that way you can start to explain how that function, uh, sorry, that faction works on a high level. You don't have to get specific at all. Um, but also you can ask if there's any aspects of the game that they liked and then point them to the different factions. So did they like how the monsters work with the brackets of health or spell casting or, you know, the specific aesthetics of a model or that kind of stuff? Remind folks that you had a good time. If you are giving demos, you should be having fun doing it. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. No one should be giving demos begrudgingly because people sense it. Uh, and I think as far as the, you know, the context of making an experience, people like to know that they made somebody else happy. It's not rocket science. You know, say you had fun, say you enjoyed it, because the next thing is introducing any events or groups. So if you're giving a demo at your local store and you're like, hey, and by the way, me and three other guys and gals meet up every Thursday to play here at the store. Please come by. We'll have an army for you. Like that's a, that's a direct invitation to, to more fun. So I think those two last two go hand in hand. of just like, this was fun. If you want more of it, swing on down Thursday nights and we'll, we'll have a blast. So friends, that's what I learned. I put it all together uh, and I did a demo. It took about, um, I want to say like two and a half hours, a little less. We were chatting at the end, just as people, you know, we're both talking local stuff. But, uh, you know, all in all, together went very smoothly. All the information I had presented, like laid out in front of him with the War Scroll cards from Dominion. Um, again, it's all about choosing the right factions to start with and, and kind of giving him a good experience for the game. If you have any more tips you'd like to throw in there, leave them in the comments down below. I'll pin the best one to the top just to help other folks in the future. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.